Ma's lying dead in the yard. My dad shot her. I think dad's dead too. Melvin's hurt. Mike asks, are you sure, Ellen? Upon hearing the account, Mike immediately sent John to Pleasant Hill for the sheriff and doctor. Uncle Mike ushered Ellen and Thomas into the house to be with his wife, their aunt Mary Murphy. Not knowing what to expect about the other children, he handed them. He had. He then headed the mile down the road in his little cart to his brother's farm. He hadn't grabbed his rifle, and his, if his brother was dead, he wouldn't need it. From the back corner of the weathered farmhouse, little Mary continued watching Mike balance Joseph's three-legged chair on the stump. She could not read or hear his thoughts, but she would listen to him and Melvin. The air was dead and quiet because Melvin was talking, uh, talking out across the backyard, and Mike was sitting out where she could hear. She almost comprehended every word they said. Mary wanted to run, threw her arms around the kind uncle she had missed, and well, I'm sorry, Uncle Mike. We tried, but Dad wouldn't stop. She practiced the words, but her legs wouldn't let her move. Mike briefly looked toward the shed and glanced at Joe's wagon. He said to Melvin, I don't know where I can take Joseph in that wagon. The church is done with Joseph's soul. Maybe the reeds will take him. He can't be buried in Holden or independent. He committed a mortal sin. He broke God's sixth commandment. Mary can be sent home to Gareth or Westphalia with her family in Kansas. The church will welcome her there. If not, the McManus or Agnew family will produce one of their own priests, but they can't be buried together. Polly stood listening to Mike and chewing her cud. Mary saw that the need for her to soon be mailed had not registered in Mike's rattled mind. Contemplating what she was about to do, little Mary knew that Mike and Melvin had left her dog's frail body on the bed, slumped over against the wall. There, Melvin had seen pieces of Joe's brain still dripping. She had heard him say to her uncle, this confirmed her understanding and fears of a third gunshot. She saw Melvin's hand from the first gunshot as she ran as he ran after Ma. Joseph's beloved wife Mary still lay warm, face up in the brown weeds of autumn. Little Mary had just seen the bullet hole through Ma's left breast, and she saw her blood soaking her dress as she was still alive and running around the corner of the house to find her children. After Mary fell, the children were dispersed, and before Uncle Mike arrived, the nineteen year old hired hand Melvin had collapsed in silence and other shock on the back steps. After Lawrence Collins scooped up little Michael and took him to the Collins' home, Melvin's home, Melvin had sat alone, blood flowing from a ruined hand, until Uncle Mike arrived. Now, Mary was hearing him continue to sob as he waited for his father, Elder Jacob Knight, to come with the doctor who Mike assured him would be coming. There were These were the same steps where her ma had stumbled out onto the yard to bleed out her life before her son, daughter, Ellen, and screaming sons, Michael, seven years, Joseph, five years, and Thomas Edward, only three. Mary heard Melvin answering Mike's questions, repeating the details and sharing opinions. I don't understand, Michael. He loved her. He didn't have to kill her. The family would have been fine if finding Kansas after he died. He should have known that. I think he was dying. He was in pain and thought crazy things. The yelling between Joseph and Mary was desperate, and the girls were both in the house. Mary stayed in, but Ellen came running outside yelling, Dad's going to shoot Ma. Do something, Melvin. Then she stayed outside with the boys, like she usually did. That's when I rushed into the house and tried to help Mary. Now, standing behind the south end of the house, little Mary could hear the echo of the catastrophe that brought audible wails of grief from Melvin as he recalled the event. Mike asked, How you doing, Melvin? Melvin answered, My hands on fire and throbbing. I can't, and I can still see little Mary rushing past me with Annie before it happened. She almost knocked me over. Before she took Annie and ran, that little girl in front of a raging father with a gun yelled out, You can't do it, Dad. You can't take away our Ma and our Annie. Your soul will burn in hell and you know it. Before she ran now, she said, Christ before you, da. Christ beside you, da. Stop it, da. Or we'll be hating you forever then. Melvin went on about the unfolding events in the afternoon. Little Mary looked straight at him, took Annie from her mother and wailed, Christ shields us, Annie. Then she fled out the front door and, approached, and across the porch, allowing the door to slam when Joe shot me. He shot me when I lunched with a gun. I could not take it from him. When it went off, I, was sh I wasn't sure it was the door of the pistol I heard. After a pause to wipe his nose on his sleeve, he continued. Outdoors, Ellen heard the first shot, screamed and ran around to the front. She probably heard little Mary bursting through the front door because I heard 
her yell to the boys, Out front, it must be Mary and Ma. So Alan and the boys ran out front, where they met little Mary fleeing toward them. Ah, with baby Annie tight in her arms, Mary stopped, looking toward Ellen and the boys, but Ma wasn't with her. Right away, there was a second shot that hit her Ma. I was just standing sh shocked outside the bedroom door beside her. The children usually hung tight together outside the door. That's where most of the fights ended. So Miss Quigley and I ran toward the kitchen door and down the steps. This time, everything was different. Children were out front again. Melvin stopped talking, and Mike gave him a moment to overcome his emotions. <clears throat> as Mary waited for Melvin to regain his composure, she felt as though she would shatter. She felt tears streaming down her face, and she found herself shaking with a kind of rage she never felt before. In her nine-year-old soul, Mary realized that the responsibility to terminate life and destroy their family had been passed to a sick, withdrawal crazed drunk with a gun in hand. He had neither right nor need to kill Ma, but Don no longer possessed rational or spiritual gumption to rise above his misery. His soul was gone. All he had left was his gun and his sickness. Knowing what Melvin would say next, Mary called, holding tight to Annie and running, knowing her Ma would soon be dead. The realization had froze her legs when she reached the bottom of the poor steps. In her head, she relived the moment she had stayed in the yard enough to hear all three shots, one shot for Melvin, one for her ma, and the other for her da in, her own, in his own hands. Again, in her tear-blurred eyes, she recalled standing immobile with Annie, staring into the terrified eyes and bleeding mouth and breasts of her dying ma. Mary closed her eyes and saw her screaming siblings turn to ma, and ma stumbled, and Melvin's demand for her to keep going that propelled her body to run past her family. She remembered how horrible it was to run past her mother, or how she hated that moment. As much as all of them. And with that, I think we're going to end it here. Now, the first chapter is still a little bit longer, but I thought this would be a perfect little teaser into Mary Quigley's Da. Now, as I mentioned before, previously, I already finished reading Mary Quigley's Da last night. It's actually a really good book. You definitely see the struggles the family has gone through, especially when, as I said in the beginning, it starts in 1877, it goes backwards to the 1860s, and then back into the 1840s, just when Matthew and Joseph were just coming into the uh, United States. And then from 1849, I believe, is then it gets back to the present day. It starts from the 40s, then to the 60s, then ends in 1872. And altogether, it's a very good read. As I mentioned, it does take getting a while to get used to the time changes going from present to past and then back into um, the present at that time. And it is a very interesting story. I love the fact how the author, Mary Jaff, writes her family story in excruciatingly painful detail in a good way. It's a very great story, a very interesting read, and I highly recommend you picking up Mary Quigley's Da. If you love stories like this, if you love ground historical fiction stories following families in times of despair, and really seeing, you know, what life was truly like for these immigrant families coming to the Americas, then this is a fantastic read. Now, my overall rating usually is 5 out of 5. I would give this a solid 4 out of 5, um, because, it, like I said, it did take me a while to get used to the um, presentation of these narrative, going from present to past and then back into present. But altogether... It's a very fascinating story. It's very interesting. It does contextualize who these characters are in this time. Especially for Joseph, because you do see his journey later in the story of how he goes from this idealistic, brash young man into this drunkard that we see in Chapter 1. It's a very interesting story. The family dynamics are really well written out. The author has done painstakingly tons amount of research to 
truly uncover her family's dark secret. And ultimately, it's very, very different historical fiction story than what I'm typically used to. Most historical fiction stories that I read are mainly more about battles, wars, um, conflicts, stuff like that. But very rarely do I read any historical fiction set in the last hundred or so something years. But this was a very good story, a nice detour from what the stories I typically read. And yeah, my official rating is 4 out of 5. I will link below where <clears throat> to purchase the book how to get in contact with the author, and keep on the lookout for that, because I will definitely be contacting the author for a interview. Now, this concludes another episode of the Wandering Quill Book Impressions. I will, again, link all the information down below. Make sure to support Mary Quigley's Da and the author. It's a fantastic read. And let me know what you think about these books that I got from the LA Festival of Books. And be on the lookout for the next book that I will be reviewing soon. Thank you all. Have a good day.